Good evening and welcome to the British School. Those of you watching on Zoom will be pleasantly surprised to see that we have no video linked to the speakers tonight. This is because Rome and Lazio have now moved into the zona gialla and so all attività didattica universitaria can now take place in presenza. In other words, since university teaching can now be held in person, we are once again able to hold some of our lectures in the Sainsbury Lecture Theatre. Tonight's event forms part of our annual master's course in the topography and archaeology of the city of Rome, and so we have a small but discerning live audience of course participants, but at the same time are streaming the lecture and its images via Zoom. It's a bit of an experiment, uh, but at the same time a relief to be taking a small step towards normality, and we'll also be recording the lecture for a future upload to our YouTube site. Tonight's speaker is Christopher Siwichi, who is postdoctoral research fellow at the Norwegian Institute in Rome. Chris also has a long history of collaboration with the BSR, having attended the City of Rome course in the far off days of 2007. And he then worked here as Andrew Wallace Hadrill's research assistant before winning the Rome scholarship in 2019. In between, he's held lecturing posts at Lincoln and Exeter universities, and recently a research fellowship at the Warburg Institute. During this time, he's been busy publishing and his book, Architectural Restoration and Heritage in Imperial Rome, came out with OUP in 2019 and is available in the BSR foyer. He's currently working on a new project with the intriguing title, The Dark Side of Monuments. Tonight, he speaks on a topic of fundamental importance for anyone considering the city of Rome. And before we start, I'll remind those of you watching on Zoom that you can participate in the discussion at the end of the lecture by sending questions or comments to us using the Q&A panel on your screen. So now, would you please welcome Christopher Siwichi and Suetonius on the buildings of Rome. Suetonius' Lives of the Twelve Caesars Biographies of Rome's rulers from Julius Caesar's admission are a hugely important reference for details about and attitudes towards both the city and the building projects of these emperors. Because the construction of public and private building was one of the most important and conspicuous undertakings of the Roman elite, and by extension the imperial family, it's unsurprising that Suetonius remarks on this activity. Nevertheless, it's worth reminding ourselves that Suetonius was not purposefully providing readers with this information from a wish to document building activity for its own sake. Suetonius' descriptions of structures are not for the most part incidental. Rather, such material was judiciously selected, carefully framed, and at times cynically edited to serve wider aims in the biographies. A range of ancillary themes run throughout Suetonius' work, for example, the nature of imperial power, the role of the princeps, but the primary interest in the 12 lives is to explore the characters of the various emperors. Much of the information contained within each biography is chosen and organized to this end, including the comments on buildings. Recognizing this influence is central to interpreting such remarks and cautions against uncontextually mining the lives to form judgments about building activity based on individual references. There's merit in looking for patterns and variants in Suetonius's treatment of this material as a whole, which as much as is possible in the space of the talk is what I want to do here. Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus was born sometime in the late 60s, early 70s AD, possibly in the North African city of Hippo Regius, where he was later honored with a public statue. Of equestrian stock, Suetonius initially trained as a lawyer, at some point moving to Rome and receiving the support and friendship of Pliny the Younger. Suetonius entered the imperial staff, serving in the posts of secretary for studies, libraries and correspondence, initially to the emperor Trajan, and then Hadrian before falling, foul of the, uh, falling out of favor with the latter in the AD 120s. His career placed Suetonius at the center of imperial life and gave him an intimate perspective on the position of the emperor. Outside of his day job, Suetonius was a prolific author. Other than the 12 Caesars, he also wrote biographical works on Latin grammarians, rhetoricians, poets, and historians. The publication date of the 12 Caesars is generally thought to be in the years after AD 118, so during the early years of the reign of the Emperor Hadrian. While it's uncertain whether the 12 lives were released individually, as pairs or as a collection, it seems reasonable that their composition followed a sequential order 
And as we'll see, references in one life appear to correspond with observations in another. The Rome that Suetonius lived in was very different to the one known by the subjects of his early lives. The great fire of AD 64 in the reign of Nero destroyed large areas of the Julio-Claudian city. And in the subsequent decades, Rome was transformed first by the Flavian dynasty and then the Empress Trajan and Hadrian. Actions necessitated not least by two other major fires in AD 69 and AD 80. New buildings arose, old ones were reconstructed and architectural aesthetics changed. During Suetonius's lifetime, Rome was a building site, not a static city with a fixed skyline, but an urban environment in flux. The state of the city that Suetonius was personally familiar with is important to bear in mind, particularly when assessing his comments about buildings that he personally would never have seen. Likewise, Suetonius's values about architecture belong to the end of the first, beginning of the second century AD, and his interpretation of an earlier emperor's actions are shaped by the mores of his day, not theirs. Monuments in Rome comprise the overwhelming majority of references to buildings in the 12 Caesars, with Suetonius making relatively few comments about building activity elsewhere in the empire. For the most part, these references can be grouped into five categories. Public buildings constructed by the emperors, the emperor's residences, so their villas and palaces, places where the emperors were born or laid to rest, anecdotes, um, which is where a particular building provides a setting for a story, but is incidental to the message of that story. And then prodigies, where particular structures as mentioned are being struck by lightning and such. In this talk, I want only to look at the first two of these categories. Before doing so, it's important to acknowledge some of the internal structures of the biographies themselves. For as Phoebe Garrett has written in a recent article, by reading Suetonius only at the sentence level, Without necessarily reading even the whole paragraph, let alone the whole life, we are neglecting important nuances, transitional statements, divisiones, and greater effect of the graduated sequence of material that is in fact how Suetonius is persuading his readers. Garrett continues, it is essential that we read Suetonius with a view to catching the organizational divisions and persuasion inherent in the subtle ways Suetonius has structured his work if we are to read and use his text effectively. The majority of the lives divide into a tripartite structure. So a biography opens with an account of the subject's early life up to them becoming emperor, followed by a large section on their actions as emperor, and then concluding part about their death. Only the first and last sections are chronological. The middle section of the reign is divided into what Suetonius labeled species and what scholars commonly refer to as rubrics, an approach that Suetonius makes explicit in the life of Augustus. Having given, as it were, a summary of Augustus's life, I shall now take up its various phases one by one, not in chronological order, but by classes to make the account clearer and more intelligible. Basically, these are categories uh, about either public actions or personal traits, such as the emperor's funding of entertainments or their overindulgent in food and drink. The examples given within each rubric for each emperor are usually presented as demonstrative of their particular virtues and vices. In some lives, such as Caligula and Nero, Suetonius presents a number of these rubrics before stating that he will now go on to discuss the monstrous part of the reign, making obvious that what was included before should be judged as good, what comes after is bad. Looking for structures and lives is relevant to interpreting how Suetonius judged different instances of building activity. For example, the extraordinary bridge that Caligula constructed between Bai and Pozzuoli. Caligula advised a novel and unheard of kind of pageant but he bridged the gap between Bai and the Mole of Pozzuoli, a distance of about 3,600 paces by bringing together merchant ships from all sides and anchoring them in a double line. Afterwards, a mound of earth was heaped upon them and fashioned in the manner of the Appian Way. Over this bridge, he rode back and forth for two successive days, the first day on a caparisoned horse, himself resplendent in a crown of oak leaves, a buckler, a sword, and a cloak of cloth of gold. On the second, in the dress of a charioteer, in a car drawn by a pair of famous horses, carrying before him a boy named Doraeus, one of the hostages from Parthia, and attended by the entire Praetorian Guard and a company of his friends in Gallic chariots. Suetonius follows this by then offering three explanations as to what was behind this display. The first century Jewish historian Josephus considered this incident uh, an act or part of Caligula's madness and godlike aspirations. Seneca the Younger saw it as indicative of the emperor's dangerous detachment from the reality of governing for the third century historian Cassius Dio, it was an illustration of Caligula's excesses and financial profligacy, 
Suetonius, in his biography of Caligula, covers all of these vices, but instead of using the incident to further illustrate these, action, these aspects of the emperor's character, he presents it more positive, as indicated by its inclusion in an earlier part of the life, chapter 19, before the crucial line in chapter 22, so much for Caligula as emperor, now we must tell of his career as a monster. Irrespective of how Caligula's actual actions should be assessed, Suetonius wanted the bridging incident to be seen as part of his putting on public entertainments, describing it as a spectaculum and placing it amid a list of gladiatorial matches, circuit chariot races, and oratory competitions. For the purpose of biography, the bridge at Bai is illustrative of Caligula's inventiveness uh, in this area, perhaps eccentric, but not a vice. As noted by Simon Malloch, Suetonius even edited his account of the episode, moving controversial details about the incident to another part of the life to suit the positive spin he puts on here. Another example of the relevance of structure in assessing Suetonius's act of construction comes in the life of Nero. In Achaea, Nero attempted to cut through the isthmus at Corinth and called together the Praetorians and urged them to begin work. Then at a signal given on a trumpet, he was the first to break ground with a mattock to carry a basket full of earth upon his shoulders. Tempting as it might be to read this as part of Nero's over-the-top inappropriate public theatrics, as documented elsewhere, and certainly political leaders at groundbreaking ceremonies sometimes conjure the imagery of buffoonery, the episode comes before the important statement a few lines later. I have brought these acts together, brought together these acts of Nero's, some of which are beyond criticism, while others are even deserving of no slight praise to separate them from his shameful and criminal deeds, of which I shall now proceed to give an account. The praiseworthiness with which Suetonius clearly saw Nero's personal involvement is further highlighted if we take it in conjunction with a positive comment about Vespasian's hands-on involvement in the restoration of the Temple of Jupiter Capitolinus. Vespasian began the restoration of the Capitol in person and was the first to lend a hand in clearing away the debris and carried off some of it on his own head. These examples also point to how further insight about interpreting an episode might be gained from reading Suetonius's text as a whole, rather than just taking the lives individually. As scholars have observed, the rubric system used by Suetonius allows for easy comparison to be made between the actions of different emperors regarding attitudes and activities. For example, the public buildings constructed by Augustus can be compared with what is said about Tiberius, Claudius, Caligula, etc. Beyond this, it is also noticeable that some of the very same monuments and projects reoccur in different lives, and the relevance of both these points will be returned to. So as already mentioned, I want to look at two aspects of um, buildings in Suetonius, residential and public buildings, and to start with the former. Where rulers live, or where people believe they live, matters. A residence can form a central part of a person's image, as it seemed to reflect an aspect of their character. Indeed, because the home is inherently personal, then there is a sense it shows a leader's actual rather than projected personality, making it a potentially rich subject for biographers. The relevance of one's private residence to one's public image was long recognized in Roman politics and has been well explored in modern scholarship. The first century BC architect come author Vitruvius is quite literal in his assessment of the dimensions and features of a house should be appropriate to the status and occupation of its owner on account of the duties they needed to perform in a practical and societal sense. But many other Latin writers across genres, including historical, go beyond this and use the example of a subject's residence to demonstrate an aspect of the person's more intimate character. The limited number of works of Latin biography that survived before Suetonius make it difficult to assess the role that personal residences played in the genre. However, Cornelius Nepos, whose expansive biographical work on famous men was a precursor and likely influence on Suetonius, does go into some detail about the late Republic and Titus Pomponius Atticus's attitudes to buildings in his life on him. For although Atticus had an abundance of money, no one was less inclined to excess in buying or in building. He had his home on the Quirinal in the villa built by Tamphilus, which was left him in his uncle's will the charm of which consisted less in construction than its park. The building itself was put up in early times and was more tasteful than costly, 
but he made no changes to it except such as lapse of time compelled. He had no gardens, no expensive villa in the suburbs or on the sea, no country estates in Italy except his properties in Aretium and Omentum. These purportedly modest living arrangements and outlook form part of Nepos building an image of Atticus as someone who was, in his surmising words, tasteful rather than magnificent, distinguished rather than extravagant. Given the literary precedent and the possibilities that the subject offers, it's unsurprising that Suetonius includes details about the residences of emperors in his biographies. That said, descriptions of the emperor's houses was not a rubric that Suetonius employed consistently. Comments vary in length, detail and focus, and while he describes parts of the palaces of Augustus, Caligula and Nero, and the villa of Tiberius on Capri, he says next to nothing outside of a few remarks about those of Claudius, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian, Titus, or even Domitian. This discrepancy cannot be due solely to a lack of information. For unlike the house of Augustus, which Suetonius would have had no direct experience of, and yet still documents, he would have been intimately familiar with Domitian's palace, the Domus Augustana, due both to living in Rome during its construction and because he likely worked within its walls while under Trajan. Great attention is paid to the Domus Augustana by authors in, during Domitian's reign, notably Marshall and Statius, who eulogize features of the design as well as explicitly link the majesty of the palace to the godlike mastery and eminence of its occupant. Later, after Domitian's murder, the megalomaniacal residence on the Palatine Hill was employed by others to castigate the emperor's character. Plutarch writes, if anyone is amazed at the costliness of the Capitolium, had seen a single colonnade in the house of Domitian, or a basilica or a bath or the apartments for concubines would recall the saying of Epimachus to the prodigal, you aren't generous, you are diseased, you delight in giving away. And he would be led to say to Domitian, you aren't pious or munificent, you are diseased, you delight in building, just like Midas, you want everything to be gold stone. Pliny the Younger is equally emphatic. This is the place where recently that fearful monster Domitian built his defences with untold terrors, where lurking in his den he licked up the blood of his murdered relatives. Menaces and horrors were the sentinels at his door, yet though he thought to protect his life behind walls and masonry locked in with him were treachery, conspiracy and the god of retribution for his crimes, Vengeance pushed aside his guards, broke through, and burst in by the narrow passages, and their barriers. And if the doors stood open and thresholds called her in, nothing availed him then, not his divinity, nor those secret chambers, those cruel haunts, whether he was driven by his fear and pride and hatred of mankind. How much safer is that same dwelling today? How much happier now that its master, Trajan, finds protection in popularity instead of cruelty, and seeks in thronging crowds in his subjects, instead of solitude behind locked doors. Given the extraordinary nature of the palace itself, the attention that it received during and immediately after its Domitian's reign, and that it offers a biographer such an obvious exemplar to expound on the nature of its builder, then Suetonius' is mere silence, he does make one remark on it, uh, is something that I still don't have a satisfactory explanation for, but we'll return to a little later. To move from what Suetonius doesn't say to what he does, in his life on Julius Caesar, first life, Suetonius observes that Caesar lived in a modest house in the Sabura district before moving to the Domus Publica on becoming Pontifex Maximus. Of Caesar's residence in Rome, Suetonius says no more, but immediately follows these details with many have written that Caesar was fond of elegance and that having laid the foundations of a country house and his estate at Nemi and finished it at great cost, he tore it all down because it did not suit him in every particular although at the time he was still poor and heavily in debt, and he carried tessellated and sectile floors with him on campaign. They say that he was led to invade Britain by the hope of getting pearls, and then in comparing their size, he sometimes weighed them with his own hand. That he was always a most enthusiastic collector of gems, carving statues and pictures by early artists, also of slaves of exceptional figure and training at enormous prices, of which he himself was so ashamed that he forbade their entry in his accounts. We get no details about the actual architecture. The story about the villa at Nemi is recounted because it serves to illustrate Caesar's desire to acquire the best that money could buy, irrespective of the cost, as indicated by the attendant passage on his collecting habits. The residence is equated with Caesar's want for possessing the materially exceptional to the point of recklessness, a trait akin to his gambler's nature seen elsewhere in the life. 
his tearing down of the villa, as well as the story of carrying mosaic and sectile floors, also sets up a contrast for Augustus's attitudes in the next biography. In other details of Augustus's life, it is generally agreed he was temperate and without even a suspicion of fault. He lived at first near the Forum Romanum above the stairs of the Ringmakers in a house which had belonged to the orator Calvus, afterwards on the Palatine, but in no less modest a house of Hortensius, which was remarkable neither for size nor elegance, having but short colonnades with columns of Alban stone and rooms without any marble decorations or handsome pavements. He disliked large and sumptuous country palaces, actually raising to the ground one which his granddaughter Julia built on a lavish scale. His own villas, which were modest enough, he decorated not so much with handsome statues and pictures as with terraces, groves, and objects worthy for their, noteworthy for their antiquity and rarity. In this well-known passage, Suetonius is not critically examining the house of Augustus in order to understand the kind of man the princeps was. Rather, it's the other way round. Suetonius himself is mining details about Augustus's building activity in an effort to illustrate aspects of his character. Augustus's house and villas are a component in his emphasizing the emperor's modest living habits as a whole. And this makes for a very selective presentation of the building. The fact that Augustus acquired the house from a man he likely sanctioned the murder of in the prescriptions is glossed over. Regardless of whether you accept the large imagining of the house of Augustus, as set out by Paolo Carafa and Mattia uh, Ippoliti in a City of Rome course lecture a few weeks ago, or you favor a more modest version of the Domus Aurea, such as that proposed by Peter Wiseman, it was certainly more substantial than is indicated here. This is something Suetonius himself is clearly aware of because elsewhere he comments of the Temple of Apollo, the library and the adjoining portico are also being part of the house. But at this juncture, it does not suit his narrative to say so. The details Suetonius chooses to include also seem intended to parallel what he tells us in his lives of other emperors. The absence of decorative floor contrasts with Caesar carrying on campaign and Augustus tearing down a villa because it was too sumptuous compares to the Goldilocks-esque Caesar who tears his down because it isn't just right. The account also looks forward in terms of contrast to what Suetonius says in the life of Caligula. In reckless extravagance, Caligula outdid all the prodigals of all times in ingenuity. He built villas and country houses without a disregard of expense, caring nothing so much as to what men said was impossible. He built moles out into the deep and stormy sea, tunneled rocks of hard as flint, built up plains to the heights of mountain and raised mountains to the level of the plain, all with incredible dispatch, since the penalty for delay was death. To make a long story short, vast sums of money, including the 2 billion 700 million sesterci, which Tiberius Caesar had amassed, were squandered by him in less than the revolution of a year. The exemplar here are quite familiar. Dissolving pearls in vinegar to drink them was made famous by Cleopatra criticizing the construction of villas that stretched out into the sea or required the leveling of mountains was a trope leveled against builders going back to the late Republic. Recounting these stories, Suetonius shows Caligula's inventiveness and his impatience to the point of murder, a trait attested elsewhere in the life in another anecdote, as well as his wanton indulgence in excess. Most of all, Suetonius is critiquing the negligent wastefulness of the emperor. The final sum with reference to Tiberius is intended to shock. The purpose of this passage is to showcase Caligula's profligacy, for it immediately leads to Suetonius being able to recount the extraordinary, inappropriate and cruel, if inventive, ways that Caligula raised more money, including the setting up of a brothel in the imperial palace. Caligula's building activity also anticipates or is revisited in the life of Nero and the description and that description of that emperor's palace. With Suetonius making the link explicit in the lines which come shortly before his account of the palace. Nero thought that there was no other way of enjoying riches and money than by riotous extravagance, declaring that only the stingy and base fellows kept a correct account of what they spent while fine and genuinely magnificent gentlemen wasted and squandered. Nothing in his uncle Caligula so enjoy excited his envy and admiration as the fact that he had in so short a time run through the vast wealth which Tiberius had left him. There was nothing in which he was so uh, he was more ruinously prodigal than in building. He made a palace extending all the way from the Palatine to the Esquiline, which at first he called the House of the Passage. But when it burned shortly after its completion and rebuilt the Golden House, Aurea, its size and splendor will be sufficiently indicated by the following details. 
Its vestibule was large enough to contain a colossal statue of the emperor, 120 feet high. And it was so extensive that it had a triple colonnade a mile long. There was a pond too, like a sea, surrounded with buildings to represent cities. Beside tracts of country varied by tilled fields, vineyards, pastures, woods, with a great number of wild and domestic animals. In the rest of the house, all parts were overlaid with gold and adorned with gems and mother of pearl. There were dining rooms with fretted ceilings of ivory, whose panels could turn and shower down flowers and were fitted with pipes for sprinkling guests with perfume. The main banquet hall was circular and constantly revolved day and night like the heavens. He had baths supplied with seawater and sulfur water. When the edifice was finished in this style and he dedicated, he deigned to say nothing more in way of approval and he was at last beginning to be housed like a man. This is the longest architectural description in Suetonius. It's often read in conjunction with historian Tacitus' assessment of the Domus Aurea, where he says the marvels of the palace would consist not so much in the gems and gold, materials long familiar and vulgarized by luxury, as in the fields and lakes and the air of solitude given by wooded ground, alternating with clear tracks and open landscapes. While Suetonius documents the Rus in Urbe features of the Domus Aurea, vineyards, fields, pastures, and woods. Unlike Tacitus, he does not single them out as specifically objectionable. Rather, as with his criticism of Caligula, the palace is illustrative of Nero, Nero's profligacy. Suetonius' emphasis is on its excessive cost, and immediately after his comments on Nero's building habits, he goes on to explain the extreme ways Nero tried to make up for the shortfall in funds, following the formula he used in the life of Caligula. Suetonius' critique of the imperial palace is not about grandiose building projects in themselves, nor a straightforward condemnation of luxuria. Suetonius does not directly comment on the morally corrupting effect of using gold and marble as earlier Latin authors did, although it might be implicit if these, is read in, um, if these are read in comparison with Augustus. Rather, the residences are presented as examples of emperors failing by irresponsibly living beyond their means a theme also singled out by Suetonius's older contemporary Pliny the Younger as a fault of Domitian's Domus Augustana. Nero's own assessment of his completed palace, as reported by Suetonius, is that he was last beginning to be housed like a man. The line conveys arrogance and detachment. If it takes the Domus Aria to make you a man, what does that make everyone else? But what it explicitly doesn't do is make Nero a god. The full extent to which Nero directly equated himself with the deity's soul is disputed, but it is clear that he promoted some form of association with the sun god, a connection which then persisted after his death. The Domus Aurea has been seen by some scholars as representing the solar monarchy, as Hans Peter Lorange coined it. Yet whatever the merits of such an interpretation, Suetonius' inclusion of Nero's claim to now live like a man distances the emperor and his palace from the context of divine aspirations. Yet it parallels how Suetonius uses Caligula's palace on the Palatine Hill to demonstrate that emperor's god complex. So much for Caligula as emperor, we must now tell of his character, career as monster. On being reminded that he had riven, risen above the elevation both of princes and kings, he began from that time on to lay claim to divine majesty. He built out a part of the palace as far as the forum and making the temple of Castor and Pollux in its vestibule, he often took his place between divine brethren and exhibited himself there to be worshiped by those who presented themselves and some hailed him as Jupiter Latiaris. Won over by entreaties from Jupiter Capitolinus, as Caligula himself reported, he was invited to live with the God. He built a bridge over the temple of the deified Augustus and thus joined his palace to the Capitoline Hill. Presently to be nearer, he yet laid the foundations of a new house in the court of the capital. As with Augustus's house, we get no real sense of the full layout or appearance of Caligula's residence. Instead, the details that, um, that Suetonius recounts are geared entirely towards illustrating how Caligula thought himself a god. In these ways, we see Suetonius using Caligula and Nero's palaces and shaping his descriptions of them to reveal something about their characters, which only makes it slightly more surprising that he doesn't go to town on the Damas Augustana or the Domitian, the self-styled Dominus et Deus. To move on to public buildings. Public buildings, um, a rubric about the construction of public buildings by the emperor, when they're emperor, exists in nine out of the 12 lives of the Caesar, 
Nothing is said of Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, Vitellius's activity, presumably because they didn't have time to build anything during their short rule. The rubric enables and indeed invites comparisons to be made across the reigns about the different emperors relative successes in this matter. Yet despite the apparent consistency in it being a topic which Suetonius repeatedly addresses, the manner in which he does so is not uniform, nor are Suetonius' accounts in any sense comprehensive. While he might seem to provide a list of projects undertaken by an emperor, the structures he mentions are highly selective and many buildings known from other sources are omitted. The remainder of the talk, I want to look at a few examples of how Suetonius orders this material and the possible impact that his presentation has on our reading of the building activities of different emperors. In most of the lives, the construction of public buildings falls in the good part of the emperor's reign, coming amid categories of praiseworthy actions. Even for the monsters Caligula, Nero, and Domitian, such acts are counted among their vices. In places, we can see this structuring consideration clearly shaping Suetonius's presentation of building activity. For example, in the life of Nero, Suetonius separates the event of the devastating fire of Rome at AD 64 from the building reforms aimed at fire safety that we know independently from Tacitus arose as a direct consequence of it. The conflagration itself is presented in the latter half of the life as one of the emperor's most heinous crimes. But the introduction by Nero of a new form of building, where in front of houses and apartments he erected porches, and from the flat roofs of which fires could be fought, and which he put up at his own cost, is included in the earlier good part of the reign, but without any explanatory context or mention of the fire that was what necessitated this. The exception to the rule is Tiberius, whose inactivity in the sphere of public building, whose inactivity in the sphere of public building is instead placed among the sections of his failing vices. While emperor, he constructed no magnificent public works for the only ones which he undertook, the Temple of Augustus and the restoration of Pompey's theatre, he left unfinished after so many years. He gave no public shows at all. He showed generosity to the public in all but two instances. Once when he offered to lend a hundred million sesterci without interest for a period of three years, and again when he made good the losses of some owners of blocks of houses on the Caelian Mount, which had burnt down. But he made so much of his liberality in the latter case that he had the name of the Caelian changed to the Augustan Mount. These comments are placed in the context of Tiberius's miserliness and the lack of munificence shown to people more generally. This assessment is selective and a little unfair. Suetonius doesn't mention the works which have been begun by Augustus and completed by Tiberius, namely the Temple of Flora and the Temple of Liber, Libera and Ceres near the Circus Maximus, as well as the Temple of Janus and the Forum Holatorium. While the completion of a restoration might be thought less worthy of note than beginning a new undertaking, this did not stop Suetonius crediting other emperors for such achievements. The Phoebe Garrett notes that when it comes to summarizing the accomplishments and sphere of buildings erected, Suetonius judges Tiberius by different criteria to others. Augustus was said to have built many public works, while Tiberius constructed no magnificent public works. By introducing Magnifica, Suetonius can dismiss any minor works of Tiberius's. Also, no reference is made in this passage to the Tiberius rebuilding two of the most magnificent monuments in the Forum Romanum, the temples of Castrum, Pollux, and Concordia. Suetonius does mention the buildings elsewhere, but as Tiberius's construction of them occurred before he came to power, then Suetonius is conveniently able to place them in an earlier part of the life and ignore it in his summation of Tiberius's apparent lack of investment in public building. Finally, it's interesting to observe how Valeus Paterculus, writing during the reign of Tiberius, presents the same activity. Valeus concludes his history of Rome with a panegyric to the reigning emperor, exclaiming, what public buildings did he construct in his own name or that of his family? With what pious munificence exceeding human belief does he now rear the temple to his father? With what a magnificent control of personal feeling did he restore the works of Gaius Pompey when destroyed by a fire? For a feeling of kinship leads him to protect every famous monument. With what generosity at the time of the recent fire on the Caelian Hill, as well as on other occasions, did he use his private fortune to make good the losses of people of all ranks in life. It's easy to read this as simply sycophancy and an effort to spin limited achievements into something more than they were. If Valeus is actually contemporary with events, and it would be rash to simply dismiss his sentiments out of hand, 
Ultimately, Suetonius might be holding Tiberius to a different standard. His judgments follow in the wake of the builder emperors, uh, Domitian and Trajan, when the physical enhancement of the city of Rome with magnificent new monuments had become an expected duty of the emperor personally. Moving again to the life of Julius Caesar, the section on public on building projects undertaken by him is quite different to that of other emperors. The constructions carried out during the life of his lifetime are scarcely mentioned and are not included in the specific rubric on public building. So elsewhere in the context of Caesar attempting to garner support by lavish expenditure in the build up to his war with Pompey, Suetonius mentions he began a forum also in the context of putting on public entertainment, alterations to the Circus Maximus and the construction of an Almachia are mentioned. But other buildings in Rome, such as the Basilica Julia, the Curia Julia, the Sipter, begun even if not even finished by Caesar, are not mentioned. The Temple of Venus Genetrix is referred to in anecdotes, but his construction of it is not. Instead, the projects listed in the rubric are all those which were never realized. In particular, for the adornment and convenience of the city, also for the protection and extension of empire, he formed more projects and more extensive ones every day. First of all, to rear a temple to Mars greater than any in existence, filling up and leveling the pool in which he exhibited the sea fight, and to build a theatre of vast size, sloping down from a Tarpeian rock. To open to the public the greatest possible libraries of Greek and Latin books, assigning Marcus Varro the charge of procuring and classifying them to drain the Pontine marshes, to let the water out of Lake Fuchen, Fuchinus, to make a highway from the Adriatic across the summit of the Apennines as far as the Tiber, to cut a canal through the Isthmus. All these enterprises and plans were cut short by his death. The Suetonius chose to include projects conceived by, but not initiated by Caesar, sets up his place as the founder of the imperial system and his relevance to later rulers for many of these undertakings are carried out by his successors. In subsequent lives, Suetonius will go on to document how Augustus built a temple to Mars, constructed a large theater, as well as Greek and Latin libraries. Claudius drained the Fuchine Lake and Caligula and Nero both attempted to cut the Isthmus Canal. This is not the only instance of building projects recurring in more than one biography. Restoring the theater of Pompey is mentioned in the lives of Tiberius, Caligula and Claudius. The theater of Marcellus is planned by Caesar and built by Augustus and restored by Vespasian. The Circus Maximus is enhanced by Caesar and later by Claudius, and an amphitheater in the Campus Martius is begun by Caligula and then revived by Nero. Indeed, Suetonius is often at pains to explicitly point out how a project was started or conceived by one person to then be finished by another. In addition to those Caesar already mentioned, he comments how Caligula completed the Temple to Augustus and restoration of the theater of Pompey, the public works which had been half finished under Tiberius. In the life of Claudius, we have been told that the, we are told that the emperor completed the Aqua Claudia, the harbor at Portus, and an arch to Tiberius, projects which were begun by Caligula, conceived by Caesar, and planned by the Senate, respectively. Suetonius records in the life of Vespasian that the emperor completed the temple of the Divus Claudius, which had been begun, begun by Agrippina, and the amphitheater, the Colosseum, which was a project originally envisaged by Augustus. Finally, in the life of Domitian, Suetonius notes that the forum built by that emperor now bears the name Nerva. In this way, a sense of continuity is created, both between particular lives as well as the principate as a whole. Whether Suetonius is overt intention or not, it reflects the conception of the urban fabric as Rome as not just belonging to one ruler, but a work in progress incumbent on all emperors. It also belies the notion that Rome's buildings are easily divisible into reigns, is a useful illustration that we should be cautious in assigning nominal credit to who was responsible for what building. In a number of the lives, Suetonius does not just list buildings that the emperor constructed, rather he frames them as examples within a broader sense of how that emperor maintained or enhanced the city of Rome. So in prefacing Caesar's building projects, uh, Suetonius states, um, in particular for the adornment and convenience of the city, Likewise, Claudius always gave scrupulous attention to the care of the city and supply of grain. Vespasian, as the city was unsightly from former fires and fallen buildings, allowed anyone to take possession of vacant sites and build upon them in case the owners failed to do so. And even Caligula's misguided justification for setting fire to Rome was because of his displeasure at the unsightliness of old buildings and the narrow, crooked streets. Suetonius hereby playing on the norm of what was expected by an emperor 
to make uh, Nero's actions and role as a patron seem all the more perverse. The most famous instance about which the state, the city comes is in the life of Augustus and the example that I want to finish with. For here too, I think we see Suetonius playing fast and loose with his material. I found Rome a city of brick and left it a city of marble. It is almost more difficult to find a discussion of Augustan architecture or the topography of Augusta near Rome that does not use a variant of this line. The quotation is seen as embodying the changing aesthetic of monumental building practices during Augustus's reign, where an increasing number of religious and civic structures were built or rebuilt with marble as the dominant component. Such an impression is broadly accurate, for while marble had been used in the construction of public buildings in Rome from the mid second century BC, during the principle it became the norm, fundamentally changing the appearance of the capital. That Suetonius is commenting on the built environment is unequivocal from the wider passage. Since the city was not adorned as the dignity of the empire demanded and was exposed to flood and fire, Augustus so beautified it that he could justly boast he had found it built in brick and left it in marble. He made it safe too for the future so far as human foresight could provide for this. He then continues into an account of the monuments that Augustus built. But Suetonius is not the only ancient author to include Augustus's observation. In the third century AD, the Greek senator and historian Cassius Dio Recounting the final moments of the emperor records, Augustus became ill and sending for his associates, he told them all his wishes, adding finally, I found Rome of clay, I leave it to you of marble. He did not, there, he did not thereby refer literally to the appearance of the buildings, but rather to the strength of the empire. Dial's alternative to interpretation of this line is by no means unknown, but it's overwhelmingly more common for Suetonius's version to be cited in modern discussions despite there being no self-evident reason for Suetonius to be given primacy on this matter. Indeed, there are good reasons to think that Dio is correct in the saying that Augustus intended the line as a metaphor. Firstly, Dio does not simply present an alternative interpretation of the quote. He expressly states that the other version, the one put forward by Suetonius, is false. Dio is not just reporting the anecdote, but also making a point, suggestive of confident and considered engagement with his source material. Secondly, Acts of construction and aspects of architecture were often employed as metaphors in ancient discourses on politics and philosophy, making it perfectly plausible that Augustus would have used one. Finally, it is worth considering where the line appears in Suetonius's text. Chapter 28 of the life concerns Augustus's thoughts on the health and strength of the Roman state, and even includes a direct quotation from the emperor about how he hopes, metaphorically, you should know, to leave Rome on foundations which will remain unstable, unshaken. Chapter 29 is a list of buildings in Rome constructed or restored by the emperor. The passage under discussion comes at the end of chapter 28 and in this way acts as a bridge between the two subjects. But the fact that Suetonius places it immediately following the discussion of Augustus's musings on government is suggestive that he was aware of the original context and metaphorical meaning, despite then choosing to interpret it literally. That Suetonius is willing to play around with the context of certain historical details is something we've already seen. In some ways, it perhaps doesn't matter if Augustus were not being literal. There is a reason that metaphors work, and it is an excellent quote for summing up the changing architectural practices and appearance of Rome during his reign. But there are two ways in which it does matter. Firstly, it only really works in translation. For while a city of brick might conjure up images of many of Rome's monuments as they now appear today, with bare walls of regular bricks, as others have pointed out, the word that Suetonius used, latericium, actually refers to sun-dried, even mud bricks. It is a term used by Vitruvius to describe a more basic, rustic type of construction. Rather than simply seeing this detail as irrelevant nitpicking, recognizing the metaphorical nature of the quotation encourages, of the quotation encourages the question of what Augustus actually meant about the state when he compared it to these materials. When taken literally, the distinction between brick and marble brick and marble is thought of in terms of appearance, dull versus refined. An alternative in line with the sentiments of the rest of chapter 28 about the condition of the state is that the comparison is intended to evoke ideas of durability and stability. Indeed, the terms used by Dio, Vienos and Lithinos refer more simply to earth and stone, the most obvious opposing qualities of which are their respective strengths. Augustus was saying he felt very weak, and he left it strong. Secondly, 
We might wonder what impact Suetonius's arguable misappropriation of this quote has meant for the study of architectural developments in Rome. Of course, we see increasing use of marble in the material record during the Augustan era, but reiteration of the line to the point of it becoming a truism encourages agency for this development to be ascribed to Augustus personally, rather than a broader trend that it was occurring irrespective of his personal architectural vision. To briefly sum up, looking at Suetonius's treatment of buildings can have implications for understanding the lives of the Caesars as a work of literature and the genre of ancient biography more generally. But as this is a City of Rome course lecture, I tried to steer the discussion towards what is potentially most relevant for the study of Roman topography. In commenting on the building activity of, Rome, of emperors, it is not that Suetonius is unreliable, but nor is Count straightforward. His overriding aim is to explore the person of the emperor and he edits his material to that end. I hope to have given some idea of how a different appreciation of his remarks on buildings might be reached, not only by reading them in the context of the structures of individual lives, but in the context of the lives of the 12 Caesars as a whole. Thank you very much.